Wildfires are raging throughout the western United States. Two fires in California are being treated as one incident, making it the largest in state history. We have a live look now of the Holy Fire out of Orange County, California, that's burning 4,000 acres. Here's Laura Podesta with more. A Northern California wildfire has exploded to become the largest in the state's history. The Mendocino complex north of San Francisco is being fueled by hot, windy weather and dry vegetation. If anything over the next couple of days, this is bad news, the heat dome is actually going to expand and conditions will get hotter and drier. The fire has already destroyed more than 150 structures and threatens thousands more. Officials don't expect to have it fully contained until next week. A record 14,000 firefighters are battling over a dozen fires throughout California. And up you go. In Southern California, hikers in Cleveland National Forest were rescued after a fast-moving fire erupted Monday. One resident had to run for his life. So I see a little smoke. We better go down there. So we rush down there in a the car and I get to the helicopter pad and the fire is already flames are across the road we couldn't cross. Two firefighters there were treated for heat exhaustion. It's unsafe and we cannot reopen the valley. Parts of Yosemite National Park are closed after high winds push the fire past containment lines over the weekend. We know this is a disappointing and challenging time for our visitors that have planned trips, sometimes years in advance. Sacramento health officials are advising residents to avoid outdoor activities for the entire week because the smoke is so thick. Laura Podesta, CBS News, New York. And President Trump weighed in on the fires blaming environmental laws which aren't allowing massive amounts of readily available water to be proper, properly utilized. But experts say that's not the issue and they've always had plenty of water to fight the flames. Also in this morning's headlines, there will be more testimony today from the government's star witness in the bank fraud and tax evasion trial of Paul Manafort. Yesterday, Richard Gates became the first member of the Trump campaign to admit to crimes on the witness stand. Gates said he conspired with Manafort to falsify tax returns, knowingly failed to report foreign bank accounts, and failed to register Manafort as a foreign agent. Manafort served as President Trump's campaign chairman for about six months. And the U.S. has reimposed stiff economic sanctions on Iran. The move comes three months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear deal. The president says Iran has been engaging in threatening, destabilizing behavior. European foreign ministers say they deeply regret the president's new sanctions because they believe the 2015 Iran nuclear deal is limiting Iran's nuclear program. The Iranian regime has faced weeks of protest as the country's economy worsens. In Wyoming, a woman is dead and her husband is in the hospital after he apparently killed her and then tried to kill himself. The Park County Sheriff's Office says it was alerted by a Florida man who told them his father, who lives in Wapiti, Wyoming, had just called him and said he shot his wife and had taken numerous pills with the intent of taking his own life. When deputies arrived at the home, they found Donna Klingbill and her husband, Dennis, both still alive. Donna had suffered a gunshot wound and was flown to St. Vincent Healthcare here in Billings, where she later died from her injuries. Clean Bill was taken to Cody Regional Health. His condition is unknown at this time, but he's being guarded by a Park County Sheriff's deputy while the investigation into the case proceeds. A Bozeman man accused of killing his wife with a frying pan changes his plea. Jake Collins killed his wife on New Year's Eve in 2016. Initially, he told police that his wife had walked away after the two had an argument. Later, he admitted to repeatedly hitting her with a cast iron frying pan and then cutting her throat. Authorities found her body and evidence of the crime inside a sleeping bag in the bed of Collins' truck. Now that Collins has entered into a plea deal, the state will recommend a 102-year prison sentence. The Bullock administration is now preparing to restore at least $30 million of cuts to state human service programs. On Monday, those who benefit from and operate those programs testified on the effects of those cuts and where they should be restored. MTN's Mike Dennison has a story. The cuts began late last year in response to the state's budget crisis 
and continued in January, affecting a wide array of health programs for the poor and disabled. Now, state revenue has bounced back, and some cuts will be restored. But as State Senator Diane Sands of Missoula said Monday, it's not all good news. Let's not kid ourselves. You cannot make whole the programs that were devastated. This is about moving forward. This is one of your opportunities to tell the department and us how you would like to see the limited funding that's going to go back into this restoration process expended. Some of the deepest cuts came in mental health programs. Officials with local mental health centers told a legislative committee Monday that funding for many services should be restored or revised and increased to keep them viable. We serve almost 15,000 people. If we end up having to close our doors, um, I, I'm, I, I don't know where those 15,000 people are going to go. And we're, we're, to be honest, several of us are at that point. We're out of reserves. We're out of savings. We're laying people off. Dozens of people testified Monday before the Children, Families, Health and Human Services Interim Committee at a special hearing in the Capitol. The committee's chair, State Senator Mary Caffaro of Helena, said she hopes the testimony Monday will do more than just inform the governor on restoring vital programs. Though we can't do anything now, today, we certainly need this information for the session, which is right around the corner. In the session, we'll have more to say about what happens. The Bullock administration will decide soon where to restore some of these cuts made to mental health and other local human services. But what we heard Monday is that it may take a lot more in the future to get the system where it needs to be. Reporting from Helena, Mike Dennison, MTN News. The Bullock administration tells MTN News it will outline its budget decisions by the 1st of September. In other news, if the federal government proceeds with plans to lift protection for grizzly bears on the northern continental divide, Montana would manage the population to maintain a minimum of 800 bears. That's one of the objectives in a newly released policy for the state's management of bears that will be reviewed by the Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks Commission later this week. Although there is no specific step to delist the grizzlies in areas around Glacier National Park and the Bob Marshall Wilderness, most federal and state managers are preparing for it. They say the bear population is increasing as seen by the numbers of grizzlies that frequent the prairies east of Montana's Rocky Mountain Front. Now FWP has released a proposed rule setting certain objectives for the northern grizzlies if and when the bears are delisted. Other objectives include making sure there are grizzly sows with cubs in the 16,000 square mile area. The proposed rule also sets standards for keeping healthy male grizzlies. The Medicine Man fire west of Billings near Molt is now 85% contained. The 550 acre lightning spark fire now has about 20 crew members manning the fire lines. The size of the fire grew due to backburns. Yellowstone County Interim DES Coordinator Kent O'Donnell says personnel numbers are going down as progress is made on containment. Any smoke seen on Monday was part of the fire's natural progression of burning itself out. With the fall semester starting up August 27th at MSU in Bozeman, students looking for off-campus housing are having a hard time. MTN's Emma Hamilton has the details. Montana State University had more than 14,000 students enrolled last year, and only a fraction of those students are living on campus. Here we housed about 4,200 in the residence halls and uh, several hundred more in family graduate housing. Freshmen are required to live on campus here at MSU, and after that first year, they can move off campus, but finding housing in Bozeman isn't that easy. One girl's living in a trailer because she wasn't able to find a place to live, so she lives in one of the local trailer parks. Students are looking at realtors, Craigslist, and even long-term stays at Airbnb. Not only are the housing options slim, but it isn't cheap either. And now coming here, especially since Bozeman is on a little bit of an upward trend, there's a lot more expense here, especially around the university. And I know for my fellow college students, you know, like finding a place that was under 1000 or even under $1,200 is super hard to find. MSU acknowledges how difficult it is for students to find off-campus housing. They do have resources to help students, but are trying to address the issue in a different way. MSU's enrollment has been growing consistently for approximately a decade every year. And so since 2011, MSU has spent, and this will be with the completion of our new residence hall in two years, MSU will have spent $110 million 
on housing. MSU has consistently been able to house any student on campus that wants to live there. In Bozeman, Emma Hamilton, MTN News. Thank you so much, Emma. And I wanted to update our viewers. We're just now learning about a fatal crash that happened this morning in Bighorn County. It was reported about an hour ago at 513 on the I-90 Frontage Road in Wyola. So we are trying to gather details on that fatal crash that happened this morning in Bighorn County about an hour ago. Very few details right now, but we can tell you at least one person has died in that crash.